Well, can the government get its tax cuts passed? Can it repeal the Medivac bill? And what role should Australia play in the standoff between the US and Iran? It's time for the Saturday Polly panel this week with Liberal MP Julian Lisa and Labor MP Pat Conroy. Thanks to both of you for being here. Pat, uh, let's just kick off with you. There seems to be dissent in the Labor ranks about whether or not to support the tax cuts that the government promised before the election. Should Labor wave them through? Well, there's not dissent. There's actually people expressing their opinions, which is, I think, a healthy thing. Yeah, that's for what democracy. dissent is. What we've said, well, no, because dissent implies that they're dissenting from an established position. We haven't established our position on the tax cuts. What we've said to the government is we support stage one. The economy is slowing very significantly. Underemployment is rising. Retail sales are plummeting. We need stage one through urgently to stimulate the economy. We've asked for more information on stages two and three of the tax cuts. Information that Josh Frydenberg promised during the election campaign that he failed to deliver. When we get that information, we'll consider it uh, in, a, in a careful process and make a decision. I think this is very important that we understand that stage one uh, is the important stage because it's the immediate stage. Stage two and stage three. Stage three, for example, has to go through another election before uh, it even would come in if it was legislated. So we need to focus on stage one, which provides immediate tax relief to uh, our working and middle class Australians to stimulate the economy urgently. Julian, stage three seems to be the sticking point for Labor. Would the government consider separating the bill? Isn't some better than none? The government's not considering separating the bill. I mean, uh, this was an election campaign where we had very clear differences on tax policy. We proposed lower taxes. Uh, uh, the instant uh, uh, component of this, which was giving people who are earning up to $126,000, but also then taking people to a situation where 94% of Australians paid no more than 30 cents in the dollar. The Labor Party, by contrast, proposed a whole range of higher taxes on people, whether it was higher taxes on retirees, on homeowners, on renters, on small businesses. And the Australian people made a choice and they chose to re-elect uh, the current government. Now, the reason why it's important not to split the package is that the government itself went with a policy. People want to see the government, uh, they voted for the government, they want to see the government's package in. And having people know with confidence and certainty that in 2024 that they will get uh, a tax rate of no more than 30 per cent gives the economy confidence, gives people confidence to plan for the future, that they'll have more money to invest, that they'll have more money to pay off their mortgage, that they'll have more money to help their kids with school expenses and their grandkids, they'll have more money to start a business. You want to give people certainty and confidence to plan for the future. That's what our tax package does. Julian, one of the problems with uh, representative democracy where you only have two big political parties is that people have to lodge a vote for choice A or choice B and they don't get to clarify for us exactly what they liked about one or the other. Are you saying that the third branch of the government's tax cuts was an instrumental reason why people voted for the coalition? Well, I think people saw the fact that they were going to pay, or 94 per cent of Australians are going to pay no more than 30 cents in the dollar, in contrast with the Labor Party that seemed to have higher taxes on every sector of the economy. And I think you want to have people being able to plan with confidence and certainty for the future. That will help uh, stimulate the economy in and of itself. Um, Pat, didn't the election give the government a bit of a mandate on this? This was a, ma a major policy for the government in the election campaign and the government then won. Is, is uh, Labor standing in the way of what the people want? Absolutely not. The government only took one election policy uh, and that was that they're not Labor. They campaigned on one fact, they were not the Labor Party. And they won and good luck to them and they're the government. But to well, argue this sort of mandate this politics plan. is they ridiculous. They did present this tax plan. Uh, if, if a, if I can just uh, finish my point, if you're going to argue mandate politics, this is arguing for a mandate not after one election but after two elections. That is ridiculous. That is utterly ridiculous. We will look at this policy issue on its merits and I've got to reject Julian's point. If you're underemployed, if you're struggling to get more hours, if your job is under threat right now, um, you're not going to be concerned, you're not going to be given confidence by a uh, hypothetical tax cut in five years time. You're very much focused on can I afford my mortgage now? Can I put food on my kids table now? So that's why stage one of the tax cuts is very important but to suggest that people in a slowing economy right now will get confidence um, out of a tax cut for those earning over $180,000 in five years time is pure uh, ridiculousness and should be rejected as such. But this is a test for 
your party for Mr Albanese as to whether he's actually turned over a new leaf and whether he's got the message from the election that Australians want lower taxes. Um, I was pleased to see the Mate, comments you of your colleague Peter Khalil this, this week, who believes that uh, if we're not prepared to split the bill and we're not prepared to split it, that you guys should support the package because that's what the Australian people voted for. Mate, uh, you promised through Josh Frohenberg whole lots of information about the impact of Stage 2 and Stage 3 during the election campaign. You provided zero of that so far. It is ridiculous to ask the Labor Party to support a piece of legislation sight unseen without understanding the fiscal distributional impacts of this. This is pure arrogance from a government that had one policy that they took to the election, which was that they were not the Labor Party. We will look at this we in had a this sober tax manner. That's right. once, we get that, once, once we get the information, it is pure arrogance to try and browbeat Parliament into passing a bill sight unseen. All right, we might move on to our second topic of the morning, and that is the Medivac bill. Doctors this week have said, or the Federal Court rather, have said that doctors don't need to see a patient face to face to make an assessment based on that. Julian, do you have evidence to see that to, to show that this law isn't working in its current form? Well, let's take a step back in relation to the discussion about these issues. Why are we dealing with people on the Ruin Manus? We are dealing with them because during the last period of the Labor government, 50,000 people came by boat. I know people don't like hearing these statistics again, but it's important to remind people 1,200 people drowned at sea, 800 people on boats. This is the legacy of the previous government. But here, now, let, me just, had... let me just interrupt you and say that here, under this current law, around 30 people have That's been correct. brought. That's correct. So country. far, so far. I mean, this law's only been in place since February. And what the Federal Court has effectively done is further weakened uh, the regime because they've effectively said, well, a doctor doesn't need to see people, they can just assess people on the papers and then bring them to Australia. We do not want people who are uh, in Manus and Nauru um, having a back doorway into Australia. That gives a signal to the people smugglers uh, that they can start up their, their regimes, that if you go to Manus and Nauru, if you claim uh, some medical need, that you'll be able to come to Australia. Now, as we also know, there are more health professionals in those places uh, than uh, uh, per head of population than anywhere in Australia. So it's not as if people are, are not getting medical treatment, but this is being used as a backdoor way to bring people to Wait, Australia. There, this are, is there a... are more healthcare professionals there than anywhere else in Australia. Well, That's of correct. course, because it's a detention camp, there probably aren't more medical health professionals than there are in prisons, for example, are there? Well, I, I can't answer that, but I, I, I know that you know that the ratio there is extremely high. The well, idea, of, the idea of that would be people... you've got people locked up. Well, no, not necessarily. You don't necessarily have medical people just because you've got people in detention. The point is, people are getting medical treatment if they need medical treatment. This whole law is about undermining uh, Australia's border protection regime. It's Labor's law, it's not our law, uh, and we are calling for it to be repealed. Pat, is Labor shifting its support on this bill? Uh, absolutely not. And let's go back to a few basic facts. First, Julian doesn't seem to realise he's been in government for six years and they're still intent on on going back to what happened before 2013. That's the where fact the legacy is under cases Peter are from, watch, and Under Peter Dutton's watch, over 50,000 unauthorised arrivals have come via plane. That has been a massive uh, weakening of border security. They've cut $250 million from funding for border security. So much so that border force vessels uh, couldn't be used because they'd run out of uh, money for fuel um, last Christmas. So that's very important. The recent legal challenge around Medivac doesn't change a single thing about this uh, bill. Uh, Peter Dutton, the, uh, the Home Affairs Minister, can still refuse entry for anyone on security or criminal grounds, fact one. Fact two, they can only get treatment in Australia if uh, they cannot get the uh, required medical treatment um, in Manus or Nauru, fact two. Fact three, People support strong border protection. The policies on border protection are identical between Labor and Liberal, but what the Australian people want is humane treatment of people in Manus and Nauru. If they cannot get uh, medical treatment in those islands, they should be brought to this country for medical treatment and then returned uh, uh, to those processing uh, facilities. And the important point, which I will repeat, is that nothing has changed the ability of the Minister to refuse entry on security grounds. Well, but that is they can't very, very important. Grounds. I everything, mean, there are people who are charged everything, everything with, uh, with else, against children everything there, else, there, and they can't Everything else, if I can finish my point, Julie, just let everything else come to you is scam. 
Everything else is scaremongering by a Liberal government that's intent on fear and smear returning to six years in the past. Nothing changes. The Minister has the power to refuse entry on security grounds. The Minister okay. uh, has the right to appeal on medical grounds. This is just scaremongering for a government without an agenda. The Minister can apply the character determination for every other person who seeks to come to Australia except people under the Medifact legislation. And where the Medivac legislation allows the minister to bar people who've been convicted of a crime of more than 12 months, it doesn't allow people to doesn't allow the minister to bar people uh, who have been charged with a crime, including people who've been charged with child sex offences who are on the, the islands there, who've been engaged in money laundering and terror offences and and, uh, and the like, who haven't yet been convicted. And we have a regime uh, in 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 relation to the character determination in order that we can maintain control of the people that get to come to Australia. This demonstrates how ill thought uh, of this particular piece of legislation was in the first place. And it's again a test uh, for Mr Albanese and Senator Keneally about whether they're turning over a new leaf or whether they want to continue Labor's tradition here of weak border protection policy. Julian and Pat, hearing the two of you blame the other side of politics for the existence of people on N N Manus and Nauru sounds a little bit like a couple of toddlers arguing about it. No, you did it first. 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 Both parties support mandatory detention. Both parties support... Well, but the Labor Party didn't processing. support those so, things during the Rudd Gillard let's, let's just accept that, that is why those people are there. You can always go back. Kevin Rudd like said, and Palestinians but, but arguing Kevin about Rudd it, said in the 2007 election interested. that they would be exactly the same. Nobody's interested. And he in chose it. not to be. Uh, and we have a legacy of 50,000 people and 1,200 people who need, needlessly died as a result of that regime. Nobody remembers those people. Let's, let's talk briefly about about uh, Iran and Trump because I, don't, I do want to get your thoughts about that. The, Australia is generally in lockstep with the United States on military issues. Are we in lockstep step with Trump on Iran? Well, uh, if you look at the nuclear uh, deal, Australia has taken a different position to the United States in relation to the uh, Iran nuclear deal. We are still part of the international uh, um, uh, group of uh, countries there that are encouraging uh, Iran to abide by the nuclear sanctions regime there and to, to desist from their nuclear weapons program. We've also taken a tough stand in relation to ballistic missiles and into the money laundering activities and terror financing that goes on in Iran. Um, Look, I don't want to speculate as to what's going to happen over the next uh, uh, few days and weeks in relation to uh, Iran and the United States, although it seems overnight that things have cooled down. And I think, uh, as a country, Australia would very strongly support you know, peace and stability in, in the region. Pat, bipartisan does... agreement on that? Uh, there is, and it should be noted that uh, Iran has uh, committed some incredibly provocative acts, and I and Labor urged them to uh, uh, avoid repeating those uh, acts. And it's important that both sides of the conflict, a uh, potential conflict, de-escalate. It's in no one's interest to see conflict in that region, and I think it's very important that we maintain a bipartisan approach to this issue, which is to uh, push for all parties to de-escalate uh, the potential conflict. All right, Pat Conroy, Julian, Lisa, we really appreciate you coming in this morning. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks guys.